Um, it's really great to have the opportunity to talk about this material with you. It's something I'm fascinated in. And the, the hardest part was uh, cutting down the material to an amount that might fit within this time period. <laughs> also, uh, everybody I met outside, with a few people there, everybody was a scientist. But I'm not assuming that anybody is a scientist. So this talk is for everybody, including people that know nothing a priori about science. And I encourage you completely to feel totally free to ask whatever question you want to ask. There are no dumb questions. Um, and I'm willing and happy to just stop and talk about that instead of uh, my prepared material. Uh, so a century of black holes. The, this is a perfect year to talk about this. The century refers to the year 1915, which is when Einstein uh, completed his theory of general relativity. Here's a picture of Einstein when he was a uh, patent clerk in Bern in 1905. That was his uh, miracle <coughs> year when he published three revolutionary papers in three different fields of physics. Um, what he had to say about working at the patent office instead of at the KITP or at a university <laughs> was a practical profession as a salvation for a man of my type. An academic career compels a young man to scientific production, and only strong characters can resist the temptation of superficial analysis. <laughs> He was not a man of superficial analysis. Um, after those revolutionary papers, he continued to work in the patent office. It wasn't until, I think, 1909 that he got his first academic position. And in 1907, he started thinking about the problem of gravity. So something you may not know, you've, everybody's heard of the theory of relativity. There are really theories, two basic theories of relativity that are quite distinct. The first one is uh, what he came up with in 1905. That's called special relativity. And 1915 finally completed general relativity. But he started thinking about this in 1907. So it was a long period of deep and um, patient uh, thought. So what does special relativity have to do with? The key statements from it are the concept of simultaneity in time, two things happening at the same time has actually no absolute meaning. I'm not going to have a chance to explain all these things. I'm just giving you the backdrop here. Uh, another thing is that the speed of light is the same for all observers. You can't chase down a light beam. It's going to go at the speed of light no matter how fast you're running. And of course, the famous equation E equals mc squared came out of that piece of work. That states that energy, that mass is a form of energy. And finally, in 1915, he completed the general relativity theory, which was the point of which was to include gravity into this scheme. And the conclusion was gravity is the curvature of space time. And I'll actually try to explain that point in a moment. And light rays bend. They don't go in straight lines. And what might really be the most basic and alarming uh, statement, and really is the central statement of the whole theory, is that the rate that time flows depends on where you are in a gravitational field. So let me explain a little bit about that. We should start with Newton. This picture is enormous when I <laughs> put it here, but that's OK. He was an enormous intellect. He was 46 years old when that portrait was done in 1689. Gravity is a force of attraction between any two masses. Uh, and it's the strength of it is proportional to the mass and inversely proportional to the square of the separation. So it's stronger when bodies are closer and stronger for larger masses. And with this theory, he unified the falling of an apple, the ocean tides, and the orbits of the moon and the planets all into one simple scheme that was captured by a single law of universal gravitational attraction. And it was that law that Einstein needed to modify to make it consistent with special relativity theory. So here's a portrait of Einstein. Actually, uh, let's say, what, what is it? 
so five years after he started thinking about the problem and three years before he finally got the right, got the final form. He was 33 in this portrait. So here I'm going to make an attempt in one slide to explain what it means to say that gravity is the curvature of space-time. And let's just begin by thinking about something more familiar. This is, should be visualized like a round sphere like the Earth. Uh, this could be the equator. And these dashed lines are lines of longitude. And what it's showing is that uh, if you start out walking north from the equator, you will eventually end up at the North Pole. And that's true no matter which point on the equator you start at. So if you take two lines that are near each other, both headed due north, that's like two parallel lines. And indeed, they actually meet at the North Pole. And the fact that parallel lines don't remain parallel is a sign of the fact that the surface of the globe is curved and not flat. That's what it means to be curved. So how can we think of gravity as curvature of space-time? The key is that the surface in which we think of that includes time as a dimension. So here's a picture. It's called a space-time diagram. Time is this dimension going up this way, and space is the sideways dimensions. Space is three-dimensional, but since I can only make a picture in three dimensions, um, I have to leave out one of the space dimensions because I need to include time. So here's a space-time picture. This is supposed to be a picture of the Earth at one time. This, uh, this blue disk, it would be a sphere, but I, like I said, I have to leave out one space dimension. And as time goes on, the disk just persists in time. The Earth continues to exist, and it sweeps out this tube in space-time. Now, suppose I have an apple, like this one, and I hold it next to the Earth. Um, it's in space-time, here it is, and it's moving through time. Its distance from the Earth is remaining constant. That is, until I drop it. <laughs> and it, its path in space-time goes like this, then. So this is an example of parallel lines, the line of the apple and the line of the Earth. These are lines in space-time, not lines in space, which, in, which were initially parallel but did not remain parallel. So that's basically what there is to the idea that, space, that gravity is the curvature of space-time. So let's think about the case where the apple uh, is thrown up and comes back down. That would look like this in space-time. The law of gravity that Einstein figured out is that the apple is actually following the straightest path it can in the curved space-time. <laughs> in fact, just as a straight line, let's say on the Earth, um, if you're going from Santa Barbara to Moscow in a plane, to conserve fuel, you go on the shortest path. And that's the straightest line on the surface of the curved Earth. Similarly, in space-time, the apple goes on a special path from A to B. It's the straightest path, but it's not the shortest in time. It's actually the longest time. Because time actually flows slower, lower in the gravitational field. This is really a mind-blowing fact. If I take two apples and I put a little clock on them and I synchronize the clock and I move this apple up here and then bring it back down and I compare the clocks, this clock will be behind because it stayed down. Time is running slower down here. Taller people get older faster. <laughs> <laughs> so it's interesting to know how much slower. I mean, we didn't ever notice that, right? When you put your watch on your night table at night, you don't calculate carefully the height of your night table so that you know how to reset it in the morning. That's because it's a tiny effect at the surface of the Earth. It's one billionth one billionth of a second per year 
per foot at the Earth's surface. So if I take two watches, separate them by a foot, synchronize them perfectly, and wait one year, the one at the bottom will be one billionth of a second behind. It's a tiny effect, but it's completely measurable. Today it's actually measured in laboratories using atomic clocks on the surface of the Earth, and it's very noticeable for the global positioning system where you have large differences in height of the clocks on the satellites. Okay, so that's the background of general relativity. Now you know what general relativity is. It was confirmed at the time Einstein finally put the last pieces together in the puzzle. He confirmed the theory by a certain calculation. He explained an anomaly that didn't fit Newtonian gravity. It had been an outstanding anomaly for a long time. I'm not sure how many years, but roughly a century. Maybe not quite. Sometime in the 1800s, it was recognized that the orbit of Mercury didn't quite fit Newton's theory of gravity. The problem was the orbit of Mercury looks sort of like a spiral like this. So the, here's a, this blue dots are the closest point to the sun on the orbit. And that position of that closest point is gradually rotating around like that. And it's possible to actually measure that position extremely accurately by using these transits. Uh, when Mercury passes in front of the face of the sun, actually it's going in this direction, it's possible with the right filter, I guess, to see this little spot of Mercury blocking out the sunlight. And with very accurate clocks to measure precisely the time at which Mercury appears on the disk of the sun. And because of that, it's possible to get extremely precise measurements on the orbit. And for that reason, it was known that by 43 seconds of arc per century, the movement of this blue point on the orbit was not agreeing with Newton's. Now, let's just figure out how much that is, because I was astonished that that could be measured. A second of arc is a 60th of a 60th of a degree. And that's per century. So it works out to be about nine minutes of advanced time for the transit per century. So you're watching it. You're waiting for Mer Mercury to come by and, and for its little disk to appear in front of the sun. And it gets there late. Sorry, early. Well, I don't know which direction we're facing. But <laughs> in a different time, by nine minutes per century, that means Every decade, it's about one minute. So you have to have clocks that are accurate to that accuracy and good uh, observations of the transit. So the point here is that Einstein used his new theory to calculate the orbit and found that, sure enough, it predicted a tiny correction to Newton's theory, which exactly accounted for this 43 seconds of arc. He said he was trembling when he finished the calculation. <laughs> that this theory, which was in a profoundly different view of gravity, agreed with Newtonian gravity in almost every respect you could think of. And for this tiny deviation, it nailed it. OK, so you might have thought, and Einstein thought, I think, that everything that the theory predicted would be just a tiny deviation from Newtonian physics. In fact, Einstein, to make that calculation, made an approximation. He just kept the first correction to Newtonian physics. It was all he needed. But this gentleman, Carl Schwarzschild, one year after Einstein finished the theory, found out that he could actually solve Einstein's equations exactly for the case of a spherically symmetric gravitational field. And he got a formula that describes the space-time geometry exactly, not approximately. Einstein was quite surprised that this was possible. It's actually a rather simple formula. Um, for the scientist, that's just the line element on a sphere. R is the radial coordinate. T stands for some kind of time coordinate. And what this tells you is how much time passes in each location. It describes the path of light rays and distance measurements. There's something peculiar about this, which is called the Schwarzschild singularity. And this is where we finally first meet black holes. Notice it's just one year after Einstein completed the theory. 
So here we have something like um, 1 minus something called R sub S divided by R. Now, even non-mathematicians can tell that if you put R equal to R sub S, this becomes 1. And you have 1 minus 1, and that's 0. So there's a 0 multiplying this dt squared. And the physical meaning of that in the theory is that no time is passing. Something very strange in this formula. And over here, you're dividing by that, so it goes to infinity. It looked like a sick formula if you use it. And the people that discovered it, actually the same year another person did, Drost in, in the Netherlands, both tried to kind of paper over this problem because it seemed clearly kind of physical. I won't spend time now explaining how they did, but they had sort of spurious explanations of why you could ignore that. The true non-singular nature wasn't understood widely until 42 years later, but it was actually understood, what is that, later, not 20 years, but 16 years later, by this gentleman, who I find to be a fascinating character. This is Einstein, a little bit older. This guy is Georges Lemaitre. He understood the Schwarzschild singularity perfectly in 1932, way before anybody else did. This is a quote from his paper in 19, actually published in 1933. He said, the singularity of the Schwarzschild field is a fictitious singularity analogous to that which appears at the horizon of the center in the original form of the De Sitter universe. Okay, I can't explain what all that is. <laughs> Key word here is fictitious. He said it's not really a singularity. You just have to understand it the right way. And also the word horizon. Its character is something like horizon, which you can't see over maybe, but that doesn't mean that there's an edge of the earth there that everybody will fall off. That's a perfect analogy. You don't fall off space-time at the Schwarzschild horizon. You can go across it just like you can cross the horizon on the earth. By the way, who was this masked man? <laughs> he's, a, he's Belgian. He's a mathematician and a physicist. He was also a Catholic priest. In fact, he was the president of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences for six years. He was educated at Cambridge and MIT, and he was a pioneer of physical cosmology. The whole concept of the physical expanding universe, the fireball, which is called the Big Bang these days, the origin of structure in the universe, and even the concept of a beginning of time are, are all due to this man. <clears throat> so to help you understand what a black hole is, I'm going to use this analogy. It's a great analogy. This is actually at the Monticello Dam in Napa Valley. I've never been there. But um, it's a spillway to get the water down to the below the dam. And we're going to make an analogy between uh, this water and space-time. And this will be the horizon. So suppose, let me just go back. Suppose I throw a rock into the water there. Waves will go out from it at a certain speed. That's the, the speed that waves ripple on the surface of water. And the analogy is you should think of this as a flash of light and the red circle is the light going out at the speed of light. If the water is flowing down here, so if I throw in the, in the pebble right at the edge, the waves that are propagating upstream are being swept downstream by the water that's flowing over the edge. So they don't get nearly as far as the waves that are going downstream. And so the wave circle is like that. If, on the other hand, I throw the pebble exactly on that dashed line, the water is flowing exactly at the same speed downward as the wave is trying to travel upwards. So the wave doesn't actually get anywhere. It's just stuck right there, and everything goes down. And that's exactly the nature of an event horizon in space time. So that's the first picture I'll show you of it, but there, there will be more. Um, that illustrated in a space-time diagram. 
Okay, now you might think the way science works is that once um, Georges Lemaitre understood this with perfect clarity, he would write a paper, the scientific establishment would read it, and everybody would then understand it. But it was actually another 40 years or more before people actually understood it. And one of the people who didn't understand it was Einstein himself. In 1939, which is six years later, and he certainly knew Lemaitre quite well, he didn't understand it. He actually wrote a paper in which he insisted on stationary matter. I'm going to just show you what a paper looks like in physics. Here it is. Journal of Mathematics, so Annals of Mathematics, 1939. I just highlighted the key sentences here. The essential result of this investigation is a clear understanding. And what was the clear understanding? It's that the Schwarzschild singularity does not appear in nature for the reason that matter cannot be concentrated arbitrarily. And the reason he concluded matter couldn't be concentrated is he considered matter that was going around in circles. He assumed the matter was going around in circles like, let's say, a satellite around the Earth. <clears throat> what about matter that's falling straight down? Why not consider that? He didn't. So what his paper really showed is that matter cannot go in a circle closer than a certain limiting amount. But that doesn't show that the Schwarzschild singularity doesn't exist. This man, and I tried to find a picture, this is Robert Oppenheimer, around the time when he did this work that I'm about to tell you about, the very same year as Einstein's paper, considered instead matter collapsing radially to see what would happen according to the general relativity theory. And here's his paper. It was done with Hartland Snyder, who I think was a graduate student at the time. It's called On Continued Gravitational Contraction. So I won't read the whole thing. The key thing is they considered matter falling inwards radially, and it kept falling in. That's why he says continued. And the conclusion was that the total time of collapse for an observer moving with the stellar matter is finite. But an external observer sees the star shrinking to its gravitational radius. In other words, if you stay outside of the star, you never see the matter cross this Schwarzschild singularity. It just sort of slows down and fades out. But if you're going with the matter, you sail over the edge, just like with the spillway in the Monticello Dam. You just flow with the water and fall into the black hole. This is a citation chart of that paper by Oppenheimer and Snyder. Remember, it was written in 1939. The chart starts in 1943. Of course, there was a world war intervening then, which occupied people's attention. But still, all the way until 19, early 1960s, there are essentially no citations. I checked all of these to see what they were about. They're not citing this for the <laughs> anything in relation to the horizon or the Schwarzschild singularity. They're citing it for things to do with the nuclear physics that was discussed in there. So it's quite remarkable that a second paper was written with complete clarity about what was going on, and nobody got the message. <coughs> so 20 years later, there's that picture. It still wasn't accepted. There was a conference, the Solvay meeting in 1958, where Oppenheimer is quoted as saying, talking about precisely the same thing, would it not be this, would not the simplest assumption about the fate of a star more than the critical mass be this, that it undergoes continued gravitational contraction and cuts itself off from the rest of the universe? At the same meeting was the famous John Archibald Wheeler, who actually coined, well, he, may, he probably didn't coin the term black hole, but he popularized it. He and his students did. Uh, a large amount of work in the 60s and 70s to understand the physics and astrophysics of black holes. 
but this was before Wheeler had accepted the concept of a black hole. He said, the collapse theory of a star does not give an acceptable answer to the fate of matter in such a star. So it's interesting to think about what it means to be not acceptable. <laughs> that he couldn't accept it. Because why not? It's difficult to conceive of a collapse into nothingness. I mean, the, the theory of Einstein, and now is the point when I should, I'll make the point I kind of forgot to make. That first prediction he made of the advance of the perihelion of Mercury was a tiny correction. And yet the theory that out of which that correction came predicted a profound enormous change in the concept of the structure of space and time. And up until people understood sort of what a black hole was, that wasn't appreciated. And at this point, it wasn't quite yet appreciated. One problem was it was just inconceivable because where would matter go if it's going into a black hole and nothing can come out? And also, nobody had a way to picture what was happening to unify the inside and the outside views. This paper by David Finkelstein was key to resolving that confusion because he drew a picture in the paper. And what I've shown you here is a piece of the abstract and the key picture. Probably this picture is the most important thing about the entire paper. The abstract line that's important for us is that the Schwarzschild surface, that was that singularity, is not a singularity, okay, but it acts as a perfect unidirectional membrane. Causal influences can cross it, but only in one direction. So this is illustrated here, and I'll try to explain in what sense. The cone represents the path of light rays. So if you set off a flash of light at this point, this is, again, a space-time diagram. Time is going up this way, and space is sideways. So if you set off a flash, light goes out in all directions. And as it goes, it goes out in space and forward in time. And it sweeps out a cone like this. And what Finkelstein realized was that the structure of this Schwarzschild solution was that the light cones are kind of tipped like this so that light can only cross a certain horizon line in one direction. Now, if you look at this, you should be quite confused because the direction is outwards. Here's the horizon line. There's another one on the other side. You're supposed to think of it as a kind of sphere going around like this. You could sit right on the horizon and move at the speed of light, or you could exit the horizon, but you could never go in. Wait a minute. That's not right. Right? The black hole was supposed to be something you can fall into, but you can't get out of. <laughs> the title of the paper is Past Future Asymmetry of the Gravitational Field of a Point Particle. What Finkelstein realized was that he had to choose the future or past picture, and he chose this picture for some reason in the paper. It's very strange, because this doesn't describe a black hole. This doesn't describe a physical situation that would arise from collapse. So I flipped it over to make it less confusing. <laughs> now it describes what you would have in collapse. This light ray is going into the black hole. This one is trying to get out, but it's staying right on the horizon. So this picture, or rather this picture, was key to people understanding this, even though he chose the wrong picture. <laughs> For some reason, he didn't realize that collapse would produce the other picture. Here's a better picture of it by the mathematician and physicist Roger Penrose, just kind of a sketch. Here's a collapsing ball of matter falling inwards, getting more and more dense, and the light cones are tipping over. So here you see a light ray that goes in. This arrow could describe Oppenheimer and Snyder's infalling observer who falls in and it takes a finite amount of time. I should say, by the way, related to time, remember that time runs slower, lower in a gravitational field. Well, as low as you can go is to go sit right here at the horizon. 
Well, actually, you could fall inside. But if the apple is sitting right at the horizon and moving up this way, then it's moving at the speed of light, and no time is passing. That's the way it works in relativity. If you could move at the speed of light, you would never age. You also wouldn't experience anything, so it's not such a great deal. But <laughs> um, Right, so no time would pass there, and that's, that's that gravitational time dilation effect. Okay, we're almost finished with the first half century. The last piece of the puzzle was to describe a rotating black hole. Schwarzschild's solution described a perfectly spherical one. But in nature, black holes form from collapsing matter, which has some angular momentum, and the black hole that's formed would be spinning. And this man, Roy Kerr, in 1963, found the exact solution to Einstein's equation that describes a spinning black hole. And I'll just say one thing about it. It had a key property that's labeled here ergosphere. What that meant was that the rotational energy of the black hole can actually be tapped. So if matter falls in and makes a rotating black hole and it's sitting there spinning, what is spinning? Empty space. There's nothing to grab onto. There's no grappling hooks on a spinning black hole because all it is is spinning empty space. And yet, it has this key property, that spinning empty space, that you can tap into the spin energy. And dramatic observations of that have certainly been made. I just wanted to show you a couple of pictures. This is um, a picture of M87, a giant elliptical galaxy in the Virgo cluster near us of galaxies. In 1918, the observation was first made by Heber Curtis of the Lick Observatory. He noticed a curious straight ray apparently connected with the nucleus of the galaxy by a thin line of matter. You might see it right there, something strange in the middle of the picture. Nowadays, we have Hubble Space Telescope <coughs> images of that thing that is a it's called a jet. It's a jet of high energy uh, matter shooting out for some reason from the center. And it's believed to be powered by a spinning black hole. And this black hole has a mass equal to three and a half billion times the mass of the sun. The size of that black hole is bigger than the solar system itself. Yeah. If space time is spinning, wouldn't any matter being uh, attracted or sucked in also be spinning? Yes. In the ergo spheres, uh, it's impossible not to rotate with the black hole, no matter how strong your rocket is. Thank you. Um, that's not the only one. Many other ones have been seen. <coughs> Look for a second at this. this. The jet from this quasar, it's called quasi-stellar object, maybe. It, this is a radio image from radio telescopes. This is 500,000 light years long jet. And a whole other talk would be talking about what's going on at the spinning black hole to produce these jets, and actually, how much do we understand about that? The, an the short answer is not everything at all. <laughs> we think we know the basic ingredients that produce that, but the details are not at all understood. But you don't have to go to another galaxy to see a giant black hole. If you don't know yet, you will now. Our own galaxy has a supermassive <laughs> black hole in the middle of it. It's got a four million, it's a mass of four million times the mass of the sun. What this is an image of is um, observations of stars in the center of our galaxy over a period between 1995 and 2014, plotting their positions. And you can see clearly they're orbiting something at the location of this star. And you can figure out the mass of the object that's there, and it turns out to be 4 million times the mass of the sun. Almost no radiation comes out of that region, and it's inferred to be a supermassive black hole. But it doesn't have a jet. It might have had one in the past, but certainly doesn't right now. OK, so let's return to the mystery of what's inside the black hole and confront it head on. What was everybody so afraid of? <laughs> Falling into what? 
Well, Roger Penrose in 1964, that's the year after Kerr found his solution, proved a theorem based on the theory of uh, general relativity theory showing that inside any black hole there's going to be, in fact, a singularity. But don't get confused by the same word being used as before. The Schwarzschild singularity was fictitious, as was recognized by Lemaitre and Oppenheimer and Snyder, Finkelstein, and finally everybody else. That was fictitious. But in, if you go deeper into the black hole, there is something that is truly singular. And what's singular is it's infinitely strong gravity. The curvature of space-time is infinite. And I want to show you a little bit about it right here. So this is a picture from Penrose's amazing paper. Um, let's focus on the singularity and try to think about what it means for a second. So remember the light cones were tipped inwards. Once you're inside this horizon line here, you could never escape again because to escape would mean going faster than the speed of light. And nothing can go faster than the speed of light as far as we know. Not only that, you have to keep going inwards. The light cones are getting squished, and they're all pointing towards the center. Now, the future, the, if you're at this point, the future corresponds to the up direction, anywhere out in the cone. If you're approaching the singularity, you have a problem with your future. You have no future. <laughs> That's the problem. As far as we know, See, look, where's the future going to go? All the futures are getting crammed into the same place. And there's no, there's no way to continue space-time, apparently, at the singularity. So this is really the edge of understanding at this point, in one of the edges of understanding in current physical theory, and certainly in general relativity. The theory itself predicts that something like this will happen where the theory breaks down breaks down in a spectacular way. The whole conceptual framework of the theory is that you have light cones that describe the, the metrical structure of space-time, the causal structure, and it breaks down in the middle. So we really don't know what happens there. And I made it just to try to guess three possible things that could happen there. So actually, this cone that I'm drawing, you can think of as the, the backwards cone here of this point. And let's speculate about what could happen. So possibility one, OK, time just ends. Nothing happens. It's just an edge of space time. There's no, nothing beyond there. The other possibility, a second one, something keeps going. I called it fractured time. OK, it's, it, it goes, it happens, it's sort of process, but it's not describable as ordinary time in ordinary space time. And then another possibility, maybe after some jumping around, it somehow manages to expand back out again. I said a plump baby universe is born. That would mean this piece of space time here is inside the black hole that this came from. So it's a new piece of the universe. You don't see it from the outside. It's, it's born on the inside. And maybe that happens. And at the moment, we don't know which of these things is true. And I can't tell you when we will know. But, or something else. <laughs> yeah, actually, that would be, there are other, other ideas, none as yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a profound mystery. Now, there's something frustrating about that profound mystery, which is that it is on the inside of a black <laughs> hole, so we can't see it from the outside. In fact, now's a good time to read the quote from Penrose. He said, when eventually we have a better theory of nature, then perhaps we can try our hands again at understanding the extraordinary physics which must take place at a space-time singularity, there is a chance conceivably that some black hole could form whose singularity could be seen from the outside. And that would be the best thing for science because then we'd have a chance of actually observing it. But it's all the evidence we have to date suggests that that's not going to happen. And like this one in the picture, they'll be hidden behind an event horizon. 
But there's another um, surprising and still not completely understood thing that happens in a black hole that could be visible, that is visible in principle, which happens at the horizon, not at the inner singularity. And that's the last part of what I want to tell you about. That is the famous, whoops, I should have figured out how this, Hawking effect. OK. So in 1974, Stephen Hawking discovered, not on his own and not like in the movie, in case you saw the theory of everything, he was sitting in front of the fireplace and suddenly got the idea that a black hole would radiate. That's not the way it happened. <laughs> there was a long period of work with many people leading up to this. And I don't, that would be a whole other talk I'd love to give, but I don't have time. But he did discover that, in fact, a black hole would not just sit there after it formed. It would be unstable. It would be sort of radioactive, and it would decay because it has a temperature, and it would evaporate by radiation. Let me just try to. Here's a picture of the evaporation process. So basically, it's like a pair of fluctuations of the vacuum. In, in quantum physics, vacuum is not nothingness. It's fluctuating fields as, with as little energy as they can possibly have. And those fluctuations are happening all the time everywhere, and in particular on either side of an event horizon. And what happens is they get peeled apart like this shows. Hawking realized they would get peeled apart, and that would correspond to radiation being emitted from, from the black hole with a certain characteristic temperature. Each black hole determined by its mass and spin has a temperature. And they would evaporate. Now, I included this picture just because it's interesting, in case you did see the movie. This is Jane Wilde or Jane Hawking, Stephen's wife at the time, not the movie. And I think it's actually the same picture that somebody just cropped out and tipped sideways. I didn't do that. Anyway. Um, Another consequence of this temperature that Hawking realized is that black holes also have entropy. This was proposed earlier by Jacob Bekenstein. And the reason he proposed it was to save the famous second law of thermodynamics. So that law basically says that the disorder in the universe can never decrease. Basically, we'll always mess things up. Now, if anything gets organized in one place in the universe, it has to become more disorganized somewhere else. Overall, the amount of disorder in the universe increases. That's the second law of thermodynamics. And Bekenstein realized, wait a minute, I could take a lot of disorder and throw it into a black hole. And after which time, it would be completely invisible to the outside world forever. And in that sense, I would have violated the second law of thermodynamics. Bekenstein said, maybe a black hole has its own sort of disorder. And that's called its entropy. So he proposed it, and Hawking's calculation actually sort of confirmed it. And that's great, because it saved the second law of thermodynamics. But it posed a new puzzle. It created a profound puzzle, which we're still grappling with, called the information paradox. And I'll just tell you what that is and then end. So let me explain why, um, what, what the information paradox is. These vacuum fluctuations at the horizon have a kind of joint information. They have a property that's called quantum entanglement which is actually the theme of the other program happening here at the KITP right now. Quantum, when two particles are quantum mechanically entangled, it means that they have a form of joint information that neither of them separately has. The system together has that information. And that happens to be a property that these vacuum fluctuations at the horizon have. So if one of them goes off and becomes Hawking radiation, the, uh, it's becoming separated from its twin. And the joint information they started out with together has been lost. And by itself, this poor particle has missing information. And that's what leads to 
um, an increase of, well, a loss of information outside the black hole. Now, why is it a problem if information is lost outside a black hole? Frankly, I never used to think it was a problem. But there are good reasons, I was finally convinced, to think that actually no information can be lost forever inside a black hole. This is another talk. I can't explain to you why. Take my word for it. We have good reason. Maybe I should put in the word good. <laughs> Not like absolutely solid, I would bet my life on it reason, but very good reason to believe that no information is ever lost. And that's a problem because the whole Hawking process, as we understand it, seems to say that information is lost. So this has been discussed for a long time, and in particular, as a result of a KITP program in um, 2012, at the end of that program, Joe Polchinski, who's one of the permanent members here, and Don Marolf, who's in the physics department at UCSB, and two of their students, wrote this paper, which kind of created a, a big ruckus. It's already got three, over 300 citations uh, as of yesterday. Um, it was submitted in July of 2012. And in this paper, they reconsidered this problem of the information paradox. And their conclusion is underlined by this blue line. Perhaps the most conservative resolution of this paradox, key here is most conservative, is that the infalling observer burns up at the horizon a completely outrageous proposal. <laughs> Schwarzschild singularity all over again. It's actually singular. Lemaitre was wrong. Oppenheimer was wrong. Finkelstein was wrong. Kerr was wrong. Penrose is wrong. There is no regular horizon. So let me explain why burning up at the horizon would somehow resolve this problem. Uh, oh, I already said this about quantum entanglement, so I don't have to. So their proposed most conservative resolution is that there is a firewall at the horizon, is what they called it. Here, I have a picture of a firewall. It's about to appear. <laughs> OK. This firewall, what this does is it's supposed to disconnect the inside vacuum fluctuations from the outside one to break the union of that joint information and to basically eliminate the shared information that's causing the problem. And they said that's the most conservative resolution. Now, um, people come down on different sides of this. I find that completely unacceptable. Probably even the authors of the paper find it unacceptable, but they claim to still believe it. In fact, I don't know if you noticed that funny thing on the paper here. This is from the famous archive. We post our papers online here before we publish them in journals. The first version was 22 pages, one figure. Version two, we have not changed our minds. <laughs> so then there was a version four. They wrote a second paper called an apologia for firewalls. Is this what the big argument between Susskind and Hawking was? And didn't Hawking finally agree that Susskind was right? It wasn't, their argument wasn't about firewalls per se, but no, it was no, about it, the it information firewalls. question in the first place. Right. Hawking thought, as I said I did, that information will be lost in the presence of a black hole. And uh, he finally changed his mind. I'm not sure he, I don't think he changed it for the same reason that I changed mine. But You say the observer burns up at the horizon. No information is going into the hole. Is that what you're saying? The information stays outside the hole? Apparently, that's the, it's not a very sharp idea. The key thing that they're focusing on is that the information sort of entailed in the quantum entanglement between the particles inside and outside is, um, is eliminated ab initio. It's just not there. So they think the black hole basically creates a, a fissure sort of develops at the horizon, which disconnects the inside and outside. And so no further information will, will be lost as a result of the things falling in. Now, how that would, what that would say about other information that might fall in from the outside, I guess there isn't a sharp picture developed yet of how it would work, because really this doesn't 
The problem is this doesn't follow the laws of physics as we understand them so far. And as we all know, hackers can break through firewalls and do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and I think that, I guess I'm one of those hackers because I'll tell you the way that the way that I think this should be resolved. But one thing I just want to point out about this is that it really is a drastic proposal because the whole reason why Hawking predicted Hawking radiation in the first place really emerged from that quantum entanglement of these particles across the horizon. That was the, the, the initial state that leads to Hawking radiation. If this fissure develops, there's no longer any basis for predicting Hawking radiation at least not a good basis, I think. And so the resolution of the paradox undermines itself, in a sense. I'm not sure how to ask this, but are, are the particles of a different nature possibly? I think I've heard one matter, one antimatter. Does that occur? Or? Yeah, if they were charged particles, one right, would be right. positive charge and one would, the other would be opposite. But, it can, but all kinds of particles emerge from the horizon, including, let's say, neutral particles, photons, Gravitons. There's no discriminating. It doesn't necessarily have to be antimatter, but if it's a particle that has an antimatter, has an antiparticle, yes, then whatever emerges, the antiparticle goes in. Thank you. Yes? Since, uh, can we really understand entanglement enough to know what's going to happen uh, at an event horizon? I mean, that's really the essence of that, isn't it? Um, I think we do this particular entanglement so the reason their paper was so influential is they were careful to phrase it in a regime where we do understand how quantum fields behave. So they didn't go you know, so close to the horizon that they weren't confident. They stayed at a comfortable distance. <clears throat> and at that distance, we understand how quantum fields behave and exactly how they're entangled. But not at the, at the actual boundary? Well, when you say at, you raise a, a difficult issue because to to locate yourself precisely at a certain location in space, according to quantum mechanics and the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, that requires an infinite uncertainty in momentum or energy. And so um, basically we're not, no statement is being made about an infinite, about sitting right on the horizon. But the problem nevertheless can be posed without doing that. We can remain at a scale where we feel confident and yet we seem to have a contradiction. So this contradiction has really been plaguing, uh, well, I wouldn't say plague because everybody's really enjoying it. <laughs> People love the fact that there's this huge puzzle. Um, it's a controversy. It's a source of debate. I mentioned earlier the KITP program in 2012, which actually was kind of the one that produced that paper. That came at the end of the program. After thinking about it for those three months, Finally, you know, that seemed like the, the only resolution they could come up with. There was a dedicated KITP workshop for three weeks in 2013, and now we've got, it's, a, it's one of the major themes in the program going on now. And it dovetails nicely with the entanglement program, by the way. Is there any math behind this firewall that can be used? Or is it you ask a very good question. Uh, my opinion is very little. <laughs> the math comes in and arguing why you think it should be there, but there's really no mathematical description of how it, the firewall itself would behave. I don't think we need a firewall, and I'll just end on my own little take on this problem, if I can say it, I mean, vaguely, but here's my take. The joint information that's in the pairs that are of uh, vacuum fluctuations at the horizon that as a result of their quantum entanglement. That information is also available somewhere else in the same space time. So the resolution is that information is not stored in just one place or one form. There's kind of multiple encoding of the same information in the space time. <laughs> right, you have a backup in the cloud. <laughs> but it's not, I should say, it's not exactly the same as the cloud. It's truly a different copy. And this has to be like the exact same information in order to resolve the paradox. Um, but I'm, 
I think it's available in another form far from the black hole. And how did it get there? I think it's communicated because of gravity. So something that hasn't been discussed very much in the, in the firewall paradox is the role, it's paradoxical that it hasn't been discussed, but the role <laughs> of gravity, and specifically quantum gravity. There's a space time, there are quantum fields, but what's the role of quantum gravity? Well, gravity makes everything connected. All masses and all forms of energy interact. And every little vacuum fluctuation at the horizon is connected to other things in the space and time by gravity. So I think that the joint information is communicated by the quantum gravitational interaction that ties everything together. And that's the only way I can explain it briefly here. But if you want to see more details, you can look at my paper online. I think I should stop there. <laughs> strength of the gravity make the interaction stronger? Could that be part of it? <clears throat> this would be very weak gravitational effects because um, a tiny vacuum fluctuation is not like a big planet or star. But the strength of the gravity nearby. But strength is not really the crucial thing. All we need is some quantum imp imprint. So I haven't proved that this conjecture is adequate to resolve the paradox, but I'm working on it. Uh, this issue of the loss of information, is uh, the concern related to uh, a loss of the ability to predict the future? Yes. Elaborate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's not just that people would be frustrated not to be able to predict. It's that there's reason within the structure of the theory to believe that the theory is telling us that we will not lose the ability to predict. In other words, the, the quantum theory that underlies the whole thing has the property that, um, given the input information at the beginning, we should always be able to project forward according to the equations of the quantum theory and, and extract whatever information went in at the beginning. So you could say maybe there's a breakdown of the quantum theory. And that actually would be a potential you know, way out, but it's not a way that people consider as the most conservative way. So those people certainly considered that who wrote the firewall paper. They consider a firewall at the horizon more conservative than a breakdown of quantum mechanics at that level. And I probably agree with them about that. Do we know the particles that are created that uh, when the black hole evaporates are entangled? I mean, they have to be. Is that what you're saying? Right. It's. As we understand the nature of the vacuum, they have to be. Right. There's really no way around that. Do we actually know what kind of particles get emitted from a black hole? Yeah, in principle. I mean, I should say we've I mean, never, we never observed, may observe what kind of it's very, The temperature of a black hole whose um, mass is the mass of the sun would be 10 to the minus 7 degrees Kelvin. So it would be extremely cold. Certainly, we've never we've never seen Hawking radiation. What about one that's four million uh, suns? Then it's even colder. <laughs> oh. The bigger the mass, the lower the temperature. It turns out. Wow, that's odd. Yeah. Uh, and the the, the event horizon throws off less energy the larger the black hole is. Let's see if it's less because it throws off more because its area is bigger, but it throws it off at a lower temperature. So let's see, it goes like t to the four times the area. Yeah, it's less. The power rate is less. So if it were big enough, it would, would throw off no energy at all. Yeah, in a sense. It would take a really long time to evaporate. But the type of particles in principle that mostly come out are ones that have no mass. And that would mean photons, particles of light, gravitons, particles of gravitational wave particles, and other very light particles. Uh, you know, I sat in um, Mr. Polchinski's public lecture a couple months ago here. I, I thought it was very interesting, but what I took from it was when we have a theory that has a singularity as one of the results of it, right. then it seems to me that it's not proof that there exists a physical singularity, rather that our theory has a limitation. Because there, the, the, there's no 
physical concept that corresponds to infinite density or, or, or something. It's, it's something that just seems harder to swallow yeah, I, than the I possibility that our theory is broken down beyond a certain point. And I got from his the, the next step in his scheme that the the theory actually uh, the singularity is moved from the center of the black hole to the event horizon right. on the black hole, and that's the point at which the our our theory or our mathematics actually start to break down, which I, I think is what you're describing here. That it breaks down in the sense that it it doesn't. It, it, it predicts certain phenomena that don't seem consistent. And so the concept that they have, that they're, they're proposing is, what, you, what did you call it, a firewall. I think that it, it's kind of easier to swallow if you say it's a point at which our, our expanded or more modern theory now reaches its limit. Right. And we're trying to reconcile the, the difficulties that come from the where the mathematics breaks down, where the newer version of the mathematics breaks down. The only problem with that explanation is that we do expect the breakdown that you're talking about at the singularity, you know, in the center of the black hole. Well, it's, but it's, that's, that's separated what, from that's the what horizon. I, that's what I got. That, so it's conceivable yeah. that, yeah, that somehow that region sort of grows up, blows up to a bigger region. So tell, or, or, or beyond the, beyond the vent horizon, then the, the things break. The mathematics breaks down to the point where it makes no sense to even think about one position yeah. versus another. It's conceivable, but it's not. Well, it's conceivable, but I don't think it's likely that the breakdown that we do expect, like you say, could you know make it out to the event horizon and resolve this particular puzzle. But that's not to say that people don't consider that. In fact, I just saw a paper today using string theory to potentially somehow combine the um, resolution of the physics at the singularity with the solution of this puzzle. So Ted, at the beginning of your talk, you had nice examples of theory predicting observable phenomena. Yeah. Very beginning of talk. And then, of course, the last two thirds didn't have that. Right. <laughs> so, what, what, what would you tell the audience about, you know, what, you know, I mean, it's hard to know. I mean, this is the advantage of doing theories. We don't often burden ourselves with this question. Well, we, have the movie, we have the movie Interstellar, right? Can we have that? That's right. But what do you see as, you know, 20 years from now, you know, what, what do you see coming that would, you know, maybe potentially help help resolve some of the mystery? That is a tough question, Lars. Um, I see this particular mystery stuck in the realm of theory for quite a while to come. Um, but in theory, if we got sensitive enough instruments to observe Hawking radiation, that would certainly be one step toward a better... Potentially, radiation. and actually there was some idea that we might even see black holes and Hawking radiation at the LHC collider. <laughs> If it were true that you know some of the theoretical ideas that had been floated could potentially predict that, so yeah, I guess something like that could happen conceivably. Then we would end up observing Hawking radiation, and then maybe observe, yeah, actually learn something. It's not some. I can't say that you know my choice to uh, consider and think about this problem is not based on um, the hope for observational evidence within my lifetime. Yeah, that's a great point. It's like jobs. <laughs>